Welcome to Shema Yisrael, to our second part of our series on the Tabernacle. We again are doing things from a little different uh, arena due to the coronavirus, but we trust that uh, you are comfy in your home, safe, secure, well, and enjoying the blessings of the Lord. And uh, we encourage you to have a cup of coffee, have your Bible, be ready as we want to go into a uh, further study on the, the significance and the meaning of the tabernacle. By way of review, last week we introduced you to the study of the tabernacle and pointed out that in scripture there are over 50 chapters given to the tabernacle. They are either giving instruction for or the construction of the tabernacle that anything that God gives that much space and time to in Scripture we know is of the utmost importance to Him. And we see also in the Brit HaRashah in the New Covenant that in the book of Hebrews written to our Jewish people, our Hebrew believers, that over 40% of that book deals with the tabernacle also. So whether we're looking at the original or whether we're looking at the Brit HaRashah, coming into today we know that the tabernacle has great significance and we really want to study it and see why it was uh, considered so important, what we need to learn from it also. <clears throat> Last week in our study, we looked at the purpose of the Mishkan, another name that meant dwelling place, and I call it that because that's the purpose of the tabernacle. It was a dwelling place for God among mankind. We saw that from Shemot, from Exodus chapter 25, and we saw it also in Revelation that it is our future, that we will uh, be in the presence of our God dwelling together, tabernacling with Him. The tabernacle was meant to be a picture of our redemption, and that overall is why it would be so significant and so important to us, and why God would have given it so much space in the scriptures. We saw that Moshe, uh, Moses assembled the tabernacle, and then he anointed all of its furniture, all of its components with sacred anointing oil that was called Shemin. Shemin is a word for oil, and so anointing the tabernacle was called Shemin Ha Mishcha. Now the word Mishcha, we saw last week, the root of it is also the same word that we draw Mashiach from. So in essence was the oil of the anointing one, the oil of the one who is anointed, the oil of Yeshua, our Messiah, and that this is the foreshadowing of God's plan of redemption through Mashiach, through the one called the Anointed One. His uh, full name is not Jesus Christ, as in a first name and a last name. In our Hebrew, it's Yeshua HaMashiach, which is Jesus, which means God saves, and then HaMashiach, the Anointed One, the Anointed One through whom God saves. Now, we studied last week also that the law condemns us and that because of the condemnation, we needed a way of salvation made for us. And that this tabernacle is a picture of salvation procured for us by Yeshua himself. That this was his redemption for mankind on earth. And we saw even in the direction that our tabernacle faced, that it was facing toward the east, the east is, was representative facing the coming one. As the sun rises in the east, the coming one would come uh, from the east to the Mount of Olives. He would come in return to the Mount of Olives. We know he has come the first time, but looking at this in its significance, we are seeing also that the sun rising in the east was a picture of the sun, S-O-N, who would be rising, who would be coming to us to bring us redemption. We saw that this tabernacle that we're studying is not the original, that it is a copy of patterns made, out, or a replica of the pattern that was shown to Moshe of one that was in the heavens, and that this is the pattern here on earth. As we go from Shemot, Exodus chapter 25, telling us it's a pattern of the heavenly, then we also can look in the book of Hebrews, in the Brit HaKadoshah, and in that book, see where it refers much to the heavenly tabernacle that this one was partnered, patterned after. The furniture in our tabernacle, as we look at our next slide, is in the form of a cross. And all of the furniture will speak to us of Yeshua. 
not just in its overall design, but in each piece in its uh, entirety by itself also. It's interesting, as we saw that in scripture, it's given to us from the point at the top, the mercy seat that we see here, and it gives us a picture all the way out to the brazen altar. The mercy seat's where God's presence dwelt, and so we see in that Messiah coming from the presence of God to this earth that he might make the way for us to come into the presence of God. That's why it shows us from the in all the way to the out that we have to come from out and go in, and that's how we will study it because we have to go in by way of the cross to be able to come to that point of being in the presence of Elohim Ha'im of our Most High God. So we see in its shape, we see in the furniture, and we also see in the colors. We'll look at the next PowerPoint, and we looked at these colors last week, so we'll just go through them quickly, not giving all the scriptures. But last week, and I'm referring to the colors you see in the curtain in the background, you also see the sashes that the priests are wearing. But we're looking at those colors. When we see the color blue, that's going to remind us of heaven, of the uh, heavenly side of deity that our one who this is a picture of, Yeshua, was fully God at the same time that he is fully man. And that's why he is called um, deity is because he did not cease to be or start to be God. He always was God. He just took on human form also. We see in the color purple the representation of the royalty of our Messiah, of Mashiach, of um, Yeshua Jesus. In Matthew in particular, but in other places also, he's referred to as the King of Israel. Revelation tells us also that he will be the king returning to sit on the throne in Israel, and that's taken literally. So purple reminds us of royalty, it reminds us of his kingship. The red or scarlet color that you see in the curtain also, red often reminds us of the sacrifice, of the shed blood, a picture of the cross, and again, we saw that the scriptures are referring to that, and these we will be going through again, so you'll be receiving those scriptures again and more so. It's a little hard to see in our picture, but there's white also in our, um, in our colors here, and white speaks of righteousness, it speaks of purity, and uh, we know that we are made righteous by God, that he is the one who is pure, Yeshua HaMashiach also being pure, and that he puts his robe of righteousness on us, which makes us pure when we wear that linen. So we see in their linen clothing, even you know, we see white, which stands for the purity of God. Now in our next PowerPoint slide, we will see the different colors are a little bit difficult to see here. We'll see them in some other pictures up close when we're talking about just an individual part. But just as way of reminder, we saw that the gold spoke of deity, again, that he was fully God and fully man. Silver, the color that we'll see at the top of many of the pillars, that silver speaks in scripture of redemption. It spoke of the atonement money, the money that was given to redeem someone, to redeem a newborn even. And we see that at the top of the pillars, we have the uh, silver, that there were four pillars that held up the curtains, and they were held up by silver hooks. We saw four reminded us of the four gospels, the four books that tell the good news of uh, Yeshua's coming to this earth for us. And interestingly enough, number four in scripture refers to earth. So this, when we talk about it, will be showing us a universal entrance, that it is for everyone. We'll talk about that very soon. Also, we see again that it was covered with linen. We'll go over the coverings when we come to that point. They were made of linen, embroidered with blue, purple, scarlet. Again, our colors that speak to his uh, deity, his uh, being king is being the suffering servant and him being the righteous son of man, a very Masonic title. The linen, as we discussed, uh, being the righteousness that, that he puts on us, but we'll see that again as we move on. We will also see that some of the furniture is made out of wood. It's usually wood overlaid in another material. That wood comes from the acacia tree, we'll see that here and that is also called Shittim, S-H-I-T-T-I-M in scripture, and uh, it reminds us of the humanity of the one who came to earth, 
who also would be cut off from the earth. And this, of course, we're speaking of Yeshua in his human life, that he came into the earth, took on human form, and was born and lived among us and was cut off from the earth in his crucifixion. But we see also that that is where the brass and the bronze colors come in, which you'll see in some of the furniture, because that was due to judgment. And yet in the midst of that judgment, we also have the, the silver, the redemption, the price having been paid. Last week, we also talked about the brazen serpent that was lifted up in the wilderness by Moshe, that when the people looked on, they were healed from uh, the, the plague that uh, was uh, coming on them for their sinfulness. And we see it was a picture of the Son of Man who would be lifted up on the tree, and when people looked at him, they would be healed from their sins. Now, just before we look at the tabernacle, at the Mishkan, at its furniture inside, let's look all around on the outside. First, as we see in this picture, and the very middle point is the Mishkan, the part that we're going to look at in detail. One through four around it represent the tribe of Levi, the Levites, the priestly tribe. They were told to encamp around the Mishkan because they would be the ones taking care of it, seeing to it that everything was done appropriately, done rightly. Um, it was their responsibility. We read of this in Bamidbar in the book of Numbers in chapter 2, that the Levites would camp right around it, and then all the other tribes would encamp, would encamp around, three on each side. The side that will be important to us at first, and what we'll study mostly, is the east, that is this side right here. You can see it's saying west pointing there, so obviously east is here. The tribe of Judah is the big tribe that we see first, and we know that uh, Judah is uh, the tribe that Yeshua came from. Again, they're on the east side where the sun rises, and as the sun represents light for the world, we know that the one who came from Judah is called I Am, the light of the world. Along with Judah, we find Issachar and Zebulun. Uh, we see on the west, Ephraim, Manasseh, and Benjamin, or as you say, um, Ephraim, Manasseh, and Benjamin. Then we see also to the north and to the south. On the north, we have Don, or Dan, Asher, and Naphtali. And to the south, we have Reuben, Shimon, or Shipsimeon. And it looks like Gad in Hebrew's pronunciation is God, but it's not meaning God like what we hear when we hear that name. By the way, if you want the scripture referring to the Levites and camping right around, in fact, let's look at it real quickly. It is Numbers 21, I'm sorry, Numbers 1, <laughs> Bud Midbar, the book of Numbers and chapter 1 and verses 52 and 53. So we'll look at that real quickly just so you know that what I'm telling you comes out of scripture, not out of Rochelle's imagination. <clears throat> Numbers 1, Verses 52 and 53, where we read, I apologize for the delay, here we go, 52 and 53, the rest of Israel are to set up camp, company by company, each man with his own banner. But the Lephaim, Levites, are to camp around the tabernacle of the testimony, so that no anger will come upon the assembly of the people of Israel. The Levitim are to be in charge of the tabernacle of the testimony. Tabernacle of the testimony is also the name given to the Mishkan as we have referred to it. And forgive me, as you see me uh, using my cell phone, I'm putting on my hotspot. It is on. Well, we hope my tablet will work better then. <laughs> uh, you can also read in chapter 2 of Numbers, Bed Midbar, chapter 2 and verse 17, that there it also tells us, then the tent of the meeting with the camp of the Levitim will set out with the, others, the other camps in front and behind. They will go in the same order as their camps are set up. Each man will go forward in his position under his banner. So as the tabernacle, remember, was mobile, when it was time to pick up, pack up, and to move, the Levitim, the Levites, would lead first, and then the other tribes would have a banner that they would hold up and their people would follow behind each tribe in its order. A lot like you see at the time of the Olympics, your opening uh, ceremony, you will see the countries come in, they're holding up their banner for their country, their people come behind. Well, each, even though it's just one country, the country, the land of Israel, 
you will see that each came under the name of their banner, that God uh, kept the tribes orderly and he moved them in order. So now, having seen all the way around, and by the way, do you notice the shape here also? It's the shape of the cross. Everything is going to point to that cross because Yeshua came for the express purpose of the cross, which the tabernacle is a beautiful picture of. So now that we've looked at the outside, let, or, or the layout around, I should say, we want to look at the court. The court that I'm referring to, you might call it the courtyard. It's made up of what, well, the, the, we'll call this a curtain all the way around. It's a very long curtain. I'll give you the sides in a moment. But we're talking now about what will focus our attention on the inside. <coughs> it's called the court. Or, as I said, sometimes you might refer to it as a courtyard. But in Scripture, it refers to it as a court. And outside would be where you saw the, the different camps um, of the different tribes that we talked about. Now, when we look at this, which separates the court from the outside and from the tribes, we find out from Scripture that it is 75 feet wide. That would be in this direction. 150 feet long and 8 feet high. Now, by being 8 feet high they, and being a curtain, they were not able to climb over it. They had to go in by the door. Now, when I call it a door, I don't mean to look for your front door and have it look like a wooden door that you open and close. But this we will call the gate. This is also called the door. This is the only entrance into the tabernacle. It's the only way that they could come in. Now, it's very interesting that they refer to it in this way. Let me take you into the Brich Hadashah, into the book called Yochanan, John, and take you to chapter, set, I'm sorry, chapter 10 of, of John, and we'll start with verse 7. So, John, chapter 10, and you know what? We're going to start with verse 1. Forgive me. I'm trying to work with my tablet and think at the same time. We're looking at Yeshua. And we read in Yochanan, in John, chapter 10, in verse 1. Yes, indeed, or truly, truly, I tell you, the person who doesn't enter the sheep pan through the door, but climbs in some other way, is a thief and a robber. The one who goes in through the gate is the sheep's own shepherd. This is the one the gatekeeper admits, and the sheep hears his voice. He calls his own sheep, each by name, and leads them out. After taking out all that are his own, he goes on ahead of them, and the sheep follow him because they recognize his voice. They never follow a stranger, but will run away from him because strangers' voices are not familiar to them. Yeshua used this indirect manner of speaking with them, but they didn't understand what he was talking to them about. So Yeshua said to them again, Yes, indeed, truly, truly, I tell you that I am the gate for the sheep, or you may even have I am the door of the sheep. What Yeshua was referring to should have drawn a picture for them that they would very well understand. Back in biblical time, the shepherds took care of the sheep continually. 24-7 they were with their sheep. They often had a sheep fold. If the sheep fold was not something natural, like a cave, if even a cave, it would have a natural opening and then they'd go inside that cave and be safe and the shepherd would be in the front where the door to the cave would be, but in the folds that they uh, made for themselves, it would be, of course, you know, outdoors, but what I'm trying to say is it would be rectangular like this, and then the door would be a narrow opening, and the shepherd again would be in front of that doorway for the sheep to come in. And just as a little side note, when you read in Sh uh, Tehillim, Psalm 23, you read about the shepherd there that's taking care of the sheep, and it says, thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. The rod that they're talking about was not a rod that would beat on, in, on these sheep. Instead, as the shepherd would be bringing the, the flock into the fold for the night, he would bring the rod down where they would have to stoop under to go inside into the sheepfold. By doing that, it was a little slower. It was a one-by-one -one process, and the shepherd could look at each sheep as they were going through and note, oh, this one has a sore, it needs some salve. This one has this problem, it needs that. He would be attentive to the needs of each sheep as they would go in and take care of them during that night. And when the shepherd would finally go to sleep, he would lay down at that door so that nothing could come into the sheepfold 
except over him. And that way he could be their protection. That's why it referred to those that, that were robbers or thieves that they came in any other way than via the entrance. And if it was a natural uh, a cave, there was no other way in. With our tabernacle, there was no other way in. Being eight feet high and being just a curtain, you couldn't crawl over it you, or climb over it. You had to come in through the entrance. By coming in through the entrance, you're coming in through the shepherd. You're coming in through the one who calls himself the door, the one who calls himself the gate. Keep that in mind. I'll give you one other word in just a moment, which you will see clearly also and understand this. But the whole idea is there is one entrance, one way in, and it is a way that the shepherd has provided for them. Now, as we come back to looking at it as the tabernacle, though, we also notice one other thing. When you go inside, you suddenly cannot see anything on the outside. Everywhere you look, because it's eight feet tall, you are blocked in your vision by the, the white curtains, the white linen. I had the privilege of going through a replica of the tabernacle that was life-size. And one of the first things that was such an awakening that just really kind of slapped you in the face was when you stepped in, how all of a sudden it was isolation. All that you saw was the tabernacle and what mattered to the tabernacle. At the outside, as we'd been waiting on the outside, there was a lot of hustling and bustling going on. It would be like a city with everything going on, all kinds of activities and people coming and going and all kinds of noise. And you're looking around and you're talking with others and you're seeing what's going on and you're doing things yourself. But when you came in, all of that came to a halt. And suddenly you would be face to face with the first piece of furniture and this barrier that shut out all the outside world. Very much like we're to do on our Shabbat. Where we're to set aside everything that, that veers for attention in our mind. We're to focus our mind on our God and on our relationship with Him and Him only. We're not to worry about the things that we are concerned about all week long. How to make business, how to, to pay our bills, how to take care of things. But this is our time just to stop, put everything else out of our mind, and just focus on ourselves and our relationship with our God. That's what would happen here. All of a sudden, everything else didn't matter. Everything else was on the outside. Everything else was blocked off from view. And now they could really focus on the purpose of why they were there, what was in there, and what it meant. And so they're going to come to very um, importantly to furniture that's going to keep their direction going to uh, their relationship with their God. Uh, the pillars of brass that held up this curtain, uh, they, they were made out of, well I just called it that, the pillars were made out of brass with brass sockets, and in scripture we see that brass speaks to us of judgment. Yet the very top bands and the crowns that are hard to see, but the crowning points of these pillars were made out of silver. Well, remember when we studied the colors and we saw that silver speaks to redemption. So in the midst of judgment, there was a picture of redemption that was there also. We read about silver being a redemption in Shemot in Exodus chapter 30, verses 11 through 16. I believe we looked through that last time. If not, you can read it on your own to see and understand what I'm referring to. The curtains themselves were to be made of linen. We get that from Shemot, Exodus 27 verses 9 through 15, and the, the clothed in linen was to speak of righteousness. What separates man from God's holy presence is being sinners. And it reminded the Israelites, and it reminds us today, that God's dwelling place is holy. That when they're separated from outside, or they're separated outside from what's in, they're separated because of sin. They can't go into the presence of the Holy God because of that sin. So the curtain and the connectors there, right from the start, would remind them of judgment. It would remind them also that there was redemption. And it would remind them of the righteousness that they must have to come into the presence of God. Now, <clears throat> excuse me, as soon as they go through the curtain, they're going to come immediately to the brazen altar. And the first place that we go when we seek God is at the brazen altar. But we'll give you more detail about that later. 
let's look at that gate just a little bit more and then we're going to go inside. But looking at that gate, we're going to see eventually as we go through all of the furniture to the most holy place, to the holy of holies, to where the mercy seat is, to where God's presence dwelt, we're going to see that there are three entrances that we have to arrive at and go through to come into God's presence. Now, that reminds us of Yochanan, John chapter 14 and verse 6. It's a verse that I think you're very familiar with, but you might see it in a new light as we look at the depth and the meaning here. As we look at the beginning of Yochanan, John chapter 14 and verse 6, we read, Yeshua is speaking, and he says, I, well, it says, Yeshua said, I am, and if I stop you right there, remember those two words always to our Jewish mind take us right back to Moshe, the burning bush, to the time that God said when Moshe asked, who do I say sent me when he's going to go before Pharaoh? And God said, you tell him, I am has sent you. I am speaks to the eternal living God, the God of the past, beyond past, the God of the present, and the God of the future. We have the one who is living always, Excuse me. That's why we we refer to him as the one true and living God. No other gods are alive. He is the only one true and living God. He is the great I am. Yeshua is claiming not only that, but he's claiming I am the way. <coughs> Excuse me. This would be Messiah opening the way to us, to Elohim Ahim, to the Most High God, and it would be going by way of the cross. So the very first way open to us would deal with the cross. And we're going to see when we go through that gate, excuse me, that when we go through that gate, through that way, that we're going to be in, going into the way to go into the presence of God through the form of the cross. We're going to see we'll come through that form of the cross, but we're going to all start right at the foot of the cross. Now, we also know, according to Yohanan, his own words, in chapter 3 and verse 16, that God so loved the world that whosoever believes in Yeshua would have this eternal life, would have this salvation, would have this redemption that we're talking about. Why do I bring your attention to that? Because this gate, this door, this entrance called the way was 30 feet wide. 30 feet was very wide. It was wide enough for all who want to come in. No one would be excluded. As I said, it would lead immediately to the brazen altar. You can see that right here. We'll see it in better detail, of course, than what this picture shows. But the brazen altar was the foot of the cross, and the only way to God's presence was at the foot of the cross. Remember also, it's on the east. It faced the east, and it was on the east side of the camp. And this, again, faced in the direction at the coming one, who it was representing, the one who also is represented by the sun because he is the light of the world and the east is the rising of the sun. Again on the east, we'll go back, we'll stay back. We're not going to go there yet. <laughs> we'll stay back. Um, on the east were the three tribes, Judah, one of the three tribes, and Yeshua, uh, we know, came from the tribe of Judah, and the Levites being the priestly uh, workers, also encamped all around and keeping care of the tribe. I'm sorry, keeping care of the tabernacle. I need to keep my words right. Okay, if we go back where we can see, and we can, we can still see here, we have four pillars there that are holding up those curtains by the silver hooks that I spoke of also. Remember again, we're looking at the four um, books that speak of the good news when we think of four. We have four uh, books that all contain the story called the gospel, that means good news, that tell us the good news of this redemption, tell us the good news of this cross, tell us the good news of Yeshua and the life he lived for us and the purpose of that. It's interesting to note that four is a number for earth in scripture. So again, it's showing to us the universal entrance that all mankind can come in. This is not exclusionary, it's not for a certain group of people, it's not for Jews only, it's not to exclude the Jews, it is to be open to be the redemption for all mankind. And in that redemption we would be covered with the linen, we would be able to come into the presence of God seen by the blue, the heavenly color, we would be in the presence of the king seen by the purple color, we would come through the shed blood, the scarlet 
and the red showing that, and we would be clothed in his linen, that would be our righteousness. And we see that in all four of our Gospels also. You see, when we look at the heavenly color, the blue color, we're looking at the Gospel according to Yochanan, the book of John, where John refers many a times to the Son of God, showing that, that uh, heaven being blue, God's heaven, the, earth, the heavenly color, and that he's the Son of God, that he is equal to God and in the presence of God. As we looked at purple, we see that in the good news given to us by Mattathiah, Matthew, who clearly brings out in his book that Yeshua was king, or is king, I should say, because he still is. Remember the, those who came from the east came because they had seen, we saw his star, we knew he was born king of the Jews. They came looking for the Jewish king. Matthew deals much with that aspect of our Lord's life here on earth even. King, yet lowly also here, that lowliness seen by the gospel according to Mark, the good news given by Mark, where he gives us the picture of the suffering servant. And that's why the red, the scarlet, reminds us of his uh, version of the good news, because it reminds us of the shed blood. And Mark deals more with that than other aspects of Yeshua's earthly life. Sum it all up with the final book of the good news, the gospel that we haven't looked at yet, is Luke. Luke often refers to the righteous Son of Man. In his righteousness, he is God, Son of Man being a messianic title, and this is what Luke often brings out in his gospel. So in the four colors, in the four pillars, we see uh, the, the good news given by the four who bring us the earthly life of Yeshua. Remember, he came for a purpose. And that purpose, we know, was for the cross. He came to die that we might have life because in his death, he will conquer death. He will conquer sin. He, he will be more powerful than anything so that through him, through his shed blood, nothing can separate us from our God. What a beautiful picture that we have of the work of Yeshua already at this point. Now, just before we quit for today. Let's take a quick look at the brazen altar. We won't get all the way through it, but let's take a bit of a look at it. Uh, just before we got to this picture, we want to look at its placement. So if we go back one, I know we're anxious to see a new slide, but <laughs> let's go back one. And we want to see, first of all, its placement. Where do we find oh. the brazen altar? There we go. That'll show it. We've come right through the entrance, <coughs> and we're going to see right here the brazen altar right immediately inside of the gate in the court. So it's the first piece of furniture that they face, and it represents the first place to come when you're seeking God. One cannot come into God's presence except by way of the cross. Now if we look at the next picture, we'll look at the detail a bit more. From this one, we can see that it is seven, well, you can't tell this, but I will tell you. It is seven and a half feet wide, seven and a half feet long, and four and a half feet high. So as this picture clearly does depict, and what I meant to say is, you can see it was square in its shape. Four equal sides, showing equal opportunity for all. Again, representing the cross, that all can come to the cross. This is the place of uh, sacrifice for justification. What's, what does justification mean? Someone simply said it means just as if I never sinned. And while that's good, a little bit better, a little bit more accurate would be the action of declaring or making righteous in the sight of God. What's going to justify me? What's going to make me righteous in the sight of God? This is the place for that justification to come, and it comes through the sacrifice that is made right here on this piece of furniture called the brazen altar. As we look at the next picture of it, we're going to look at different views. Not one picture covers everything that we want to see. Uh, I want to go to the one, okay, let's do this one. That will work. I'm not sure that's the one that I wanted, but it does. It, it works well. The sinner, in this case it's the Israelite who knows he's sin, who knows he needs to make a sacrifice. He is going to come. As you can see here, it would be as if he's uh, making the, the sacrifice here. I mean, the priest is going to make the sacrifice for him, but he's bringing the lamb in. 
And then the lamb would be placed on the brazen altar, tied to the brazen altar, and the lamb would be sacrificed in place of the sinner. Then it would be the priest that would take the blood and go on. So it's not that the sinner goes on. The animals died in the sinner's stead, and then the priest would go into the presence of God on the basis of that sacrifice for the sinner. So now if we go back one, we go to where we see the big square, there's one more part that we'll look at just real quickly of our brazen altar, and that's where we'll stop for tonight. And that is here. We see a grating. Now, if we go to the next slide that showed that grating separate, there you go. This is more like halfway. This is a better picture showing that. It just doesn't show some of the other detail as well. But it would be about halfway inside, so there was room to put the sacrifice there. The sacrifice would be burned up, and the ashes would be down below. And then those ashes would be um, scooped up, and they would be taken out to a clean place. And we're going to see all of that is representing our Messiah, Yeshua Jesus, also. We'll look into the detail of how all of that represents him. But at this point, let me just remind you, this is a box. It was made of acacia wood and it was overlaid with bronze. It looks a little more like gold in this picture, but it's why it's called a brazen altar, because it was bronze or brass. And the acacia wood speaks of uh, Messiah's humanity, Yeshua's humanity. The bronze speaking of judgment, because he's going to take our judgment on himself. Then when, and I'll just give you this, and then I'll review it again next week, then when the ashes are taken, and they're taken out, and they were taken and laid in a clean place, it's even a picture of Messiah being laid in a clean tomb. Now, it is interesting to note just in closing that this uh, altar here, this brazen altar, we see even prior to the tabernacle when Moshe received the law on Mount Sinai. And we know what happened at that time, that they broke the law before he even came down with it, and he had to go back up and receive it again. But Moshe made, at the foot of the mountain, he made an altar there that they might make a sacrifice for forgiveness of sin there. We see the picture given very clearly, even before it was put into the tabernacle, the need for the atonement, the need for the sacrifice to be made because the law condemned. We'll edit that part. Because the law condemned, but Yeshua... Bring, removes that condemnation and brings us life. As we close, let that be the thought that stays with you as you even see already in the tabernacle, in the foot of the tabernacle, the foot of the cross. We come to the foot of the cross that we might receive that forgiveness, that we might have a substitute, that we are not in judgment, but that we are redeemed. We're redeemed with a price that is priceless, and that is the shed blood of Yeshua Jesus who came to purchase us back that we might be able to go into the presence of the living God. Hallelujah. What better point could there be to end on? Yet I'm not even through with the altar. We'll pick it up next time and we'll see something else very interesting in our altar in the full picture that we're given in just the first piece of our furniture, of our tabernacle. It's as if we've got a story inside a story inside a story inside the, the, the great story, because remember, every piece speaks to us of the redemption of our Messiah. Hallelujah. If you don't know him, let him know you want to receive him now just simply by opening your heart and saying, I need that judgment forgiven. I need the sacrifice in my place. I accept you, Yeshua and he will come into you and bring you that redemption. And if you do know him, rejoice in the fact that you have that salvation procured for you forever. One day, you will literally go to the head of the cross, to the mercy seat, and I'm not talking about the one on earth. We'll tell you how you get to the heavenly one as we go on. We'll conclude with this for this time. Let's close with a word of prayer. Adonai Yeshua, our Messiah, Lord Jesus, our Savior, we thank you that you are our atoning sacrifice, that you came to be our Redeemer, that you came to spare us from the judgment we deserve by dying in our place, rising from the dead, and living forevermore. Lord, thank you that we simply need to open our hearts to you, 
and you are our sacrifice once and for all. For those who do not know you, Lord, may they open their heart to you now, and for those of us who do, let us rejoice and thank you forever and ever for doing all that needed to be done that we might one day live in your very presence with Elohim Ayim, the Most High God, the one true and living God of Israel. We praise you and we thank you. In the name of Adonai Yeshua, our Lord Jesus, amen and amen.